right, this is all well and good now. I've got my Aspire project and I've got my API. I can emulate Lambda locally. I can query DynamoDB. But now I just need to add a couple of other features. I need to add a couple of Lambda functions that actually interact with Amazon SQS. So I've got my API running on Lambda, that's good. I can run that on Aspire. I've got my now two Lambda functions that are reacting to events that other systems publish. And now I also want to test them as well. But how would I go about emulating SQS on my machine? This Lambda function in the real world is going to be hooked up to SQS. It's gonna be polling the SQS queue and invoking the Lambda function. How can I even begin to emulate that locally on my machine? Do I need to build AWS? This is annoying. Thought we were getting somewhere. God damn it. Hi, I'm James Easton, and in this video, you're going to learn how you can leverage .NET Aspire to dramatically improve the local development experience for building Lambda functions that react to asynchronous event sources. Things like Amazon SQS, Amazon EventBridge, SNS, Kinesis. Now, I know what you're thinking. In the last video, I talked about emulating the cloud locally. Which begs the question, how far do you possibly want to go with this? Do you want to try to find a way to emulate all possible event sources that Lambda has, getting to the point where you're basically rebuilding the entirety of AWS yourself? If you hadn't already thought it, the answer to that question is clearly no. But what else can you do? Of course, there's the option to set up and run something like local stack, but that would only get you half the way there. That would set up the required infrastructure, but wouldn't allow you to actually invoke your Lambda functions running locally on your machine. So we're going to just park local stack to one side for now. Maybe that'll come in the next video. Now, if you watched the last video in this short series, you'll have seen that we use .NET Aspire to set up and run both API Gateway locally, your Lambda functions, and also DynamoDB local as a database. These are all services provided by AWS themselves, DynamoDB local, AWS product, the actual Lambda and API Gateway emulator built by the .NET team at AWS. So what can we do for these more asynchronous event sources? So as well as the four Lambda functions you had in the last video, there's now also these two additional Lambda functions. There's this product restocked event handler and this product purchased event handler. If you just very quickly go and have a look at the code for those two event handlers, they're both very, very similar. They're reacting to events sent to Amazon SQS. So when you deploy this, this function is gonna be hooked up to SQS. It's gonna pull SQS on your behalf, pull in those messages and invoke your Lambda functions. We're gonna deserialize them events and run some business logic for you in both cases. So we want to actually test these locally. So first off, how can you actually go about doing that? Well, one option you have is to simply just run Aspire locally. So I'm going to start things up in debug mode. That has launched me into the Aspire dashboard now that things are locking. And as you saw in the last video, you've also got this Lambda test tool UI. And from this UI, you can actually invoke your Lambda function. So one option you have to run things locally is to simply start up Aspire go over to your handler. I'm going to use my product restocked event handler, drop a breakpoint in there. It looks like there's already one there. Come back to the Lambda test tool, open up the actual required Lambda function, select an SQS event over in this left-hand side, hit invoke, and that's going to drop you into your handler. You can step through the code here. I would expect this to fail because the actual, yeah, the actual input is not good. So that's one option you have. You can actually, from the Lambda test tool UI, actually send messages to your Lambda function. Now this is great, but it's not particularly useful because, well, you need to remember what the right input is for your specific event type. You need to store all those different event structures somewhere in JSON. You need to come into this different UI. You need to manually invoke your Lambda functions and set your breakpoints. What if you want to do things a bit more programmatically? Or what if you want to do things a slightly different way? One of the things I learned as part of putting together these samples is that there's actually a really cool feature in the AWS SDK. And thank you to Noam Johansson at AWS for pointing this out to me. And that's that this Lambda test tool UI can actually be invoked using the Lambda SDK. So if you create a new instance of the Lambda SDK, the standard .NET library, send an invoke request to the function name, which is one of your functions that are running inside the test tool, set the service URL of the SDK to whatever the URL is for the test tool locally, this will actually invoke your Lambda functions locally. So you can use the Lambda SDK to make calls 
to the Lambda functions running locally on your machine. Now, that's kind of useful, but how can this better integrate with Aspire? Now, one of the really cool things that Aspire supports is this idea of custom resource command. A really cool one when it comes to setting a project up for testing. If you imagine you're a new developer, you come along, you sit down at a first project, you launch your Aspire dashboard and you think, how the heck do I open or launch this product purchase event hand? So what these custom commands allow you to do is to actually add an additional drop-down option to your Aspire dashboard. So I've added these two with Lambda test commands extension methods back in. I'll talk about what they do under the hood in just a second. First, I wanna show you actually what that looks like in the Aspire UI. So I've relaunched the Aspire UI now, and if I come down to my product purchase event handler again, and I hit the three ellipses over on the var side here, you see I've got this new additional send to product restocked v1 option in the menu. Similarly, if I open my product restocked, I've got one that says send to product restocked v1. Looking at my Lambda functions for my API handlers, that option doesn't exist. So that's a custom option. This is these custom resource commands that Aspire supports. And if I go to my product purchased event handler, send a message, I initially get dropped into my handler. This SQS event will now also have the correct body that the actual event is expecting. So if I actually start to work through this now, come through, I serialize my body. When I try and get the product, this product is actually this product actually isn't going to exist because I've not created the product first. So this is actually going to fail, but you see the actual payload that comes in is successfully deserialized into the structure that I expect. So how exactly is this working? So this with Lambda test commands method here is actually an extension method. This is a custom extension method from inside the code base. And if you go and have a look at this now, you see the first thing I'm doing is actually adding to my distributed application builder, I'm adding the Amazon Lambda client. And remember when you create that Lambda client, you need to pass in the service URL for the locally running Lambda emulator. Now there's no easy way to do this at the minute. The best you can do is to look at all of the resources inside your distributed application builder and find the resource with the name Lambda Service Emulator. You then get this Lambda Service Emulator resource, which you can pass into your Lambda test commands. And then from those endpoints, I can parse out the connection string. This is actually going to give me the HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon whatever port the Lambda Service Emulator happens to be running on. So there's no easy way to get that at the minute, but that's something you'll need to do to actually get that to actually get that URL that the emulator is running on. And then I can create, then you can create a Lambda client. You need to pass in some kind of credentials so I can just pass in a dummy key and a dummy secret, setting the service URL to be the connection string that you've just parsed from that Lambda service emulator. On the actual iResource Builder interface, you've got this with command method. This allows you to create that custom command from the dropdown that you saw in the Aspire UI. So I'm going to create a new command. That new command is going to have the name of the queue that I want to call send the message to, and the display name in the UI is just gonna be send to the name of the queue. These options here are just passed into this extension method as part of this Lambda test SQS message. And then you can pass in this function on the end that will actually get called when someone clicks that button inside the Aspire UI. When that button is clicked in the UI, I'm gonna grab my Lambda client from my dependency injection container. That is the Lambda client that was configured here. And then I'm going to send an invoke request to the function name again from the command that's passed into this extension method, creating a new SQS event setting the body to be the body of the input message. So what this actually looks like when you call this, I'm saying with Lambda test commands, I pass in that Lambda service emulator. Remember, this is the actual Lambda test tool UI. I'm going to send a new Lambda test SQS message that is going to be of type a product restocked test message. The queue is product.restock.v1. The function name is product restocked event handler. You'll notice that function name there matches the name of the actual function up here. I should probably pull that out into a variable. And then you've got, the actual message that I want to send. So I'm going to send this product restock test message with a product ID of test product and a stock level of 100. What this gives you now is the ability whenever you start up Aspire to have this list of test messages that you can use to invoke your Lambda function and you need to add a new one, you can simply just add another call to the same extension method and give it a different name. So let's say product restock.invalid.v1 we're still gonna call the product restocked event handler and maybe we set the product ID to be null in this case. And we can test how our Lambda function deals with an event that comes in that has a null product ID, for example. So this is one way you can use Aspire to actually test your asynchronous functions. And of course, because under the hood, you're just calling this invoke async method, which is actually 
what the Lambda service is doing behind the scenes when you run this in AWS. If you're not familiar, when you hook your Lambda function up to SQS, behind the scenes, Lambda just creates a fleet of pollers. Those pollers are polling the SQS queue on your behalf. All them pollers are doing is pulling the message from SQS and then calling this invoke async method. That is all the Lambda pollers do. No matter how you invoke your Lambda function, eventually it ends up at this invoke async method. So although you're not directly emulating that behavior of SQS to Lambda because you can't run the Lambda pollers locally on your machine, you are replicating the behavior of how that service runs under the hood. So this is one option you have for invoking your Lambda functions. But what about if you want to do things in a more automated way? Well, let's have a look at the integration test now. And I'm sure some of you listening can actually envisage how these integration tests will work. So you'll have seen in the last video as part of the integration test, you've got this test setup fixture. In this test setup fixture, it uses the Aspire testing support to actually launch Aspire as part of your integration test run. So the one thing that's changed from the last video in this little piece of code is that when we create this API driver, the API driver just gives all the methods to actually call into our functions. We're now also adding the Amazon Lambda client. So we're creating an instance of the Lambda SDK as part of this API driver. As part of that, we're pulling the Lambda test tool URL, and we're doing that in a similar way that we did inside them test commands, where we're getting the resource called Lambda Service Emulator and grabbing the HTTP endpoint. So you can then use that to create a new Amazon Lambda client, passing in, again, some dummy credentials for your SDK. When it comes to actually looking at the integration tests now, if I go and look at my tests, I've got a test here that can say, can create new product and restock. So this test is gonna test that I can actually create a new product and then I can inject a product restocked message for that product ID that's just been created and then check that the product stock level gets incremented to the stock level that is set up here. Behind the scenes, this inject product restocked message method, if I just go and have a look at that here, this is doing very similar things to what Aspire did inside that test command in that we're creating a new SQS event. We're setting the message body to be the actual body of the product restock message and then calling that invoke async method. If I go on, if you go and have a look at the test now, I look at my AWS tests, my API tests, and I call, I'm gonna call this in debug mode, can create new product and restock. So I'm debugging the integration test now and come back over here, ensure that breakpoint is still set, which it is. And we'll just wait for this integration test to start up and run. And there we go. As part of that integration test run, this has hit my product restock the event handler. And I'm just going to step through here and we'll check that this should all actually work correctly now. The product should be found. Product to restock. I'm going to call the update method. Let that continue now. And then hopefully this integration test should then pass. And it didn't pass, which is strange. So let's see if we can actually use Aspire now to debug exactly what is going on here. So I'm going to call that in debug mode again. I'm going to run my integration test again, and I want to step through exactly what is happening as part of this method. So we know it got as far as this restock. So I'm going to drop a breakpoint in there, and we'll see what happens when this restock method is actually called. So we've hit the start of our handler. Great. We can continue through there. We get to this call to restock. So let's actually have a look what's happening here. So we're setting the stock level to be the new stock level. So that all looks okay. When we step back out of there, if you have a look at the product here, the product stock level is set to 10. So everything seems to be working okay from a business logic perspective. Let's have a look at this update method where we're actually making the call to DynamoDB. So we've got this put item call and then we're calling this product mapper. So let's go and have a look at this product mapper. I'm gonna again, drop my breakpoint in here so we can step through. And actually, when I'm making the call to DynamoDB, I can see that I'm setting the partition key, the name and the price, but I'm not actually setting the stock level as part of my call to DynamoDB. Equally, when the get request runs, I'm also not getting the stock level when I make the get request to DynamoDB. So here you've identified an issue running everything locally on your machine, both DynamoDB, you're invoking your Lambda function or you're simulating the invoke of your Lambda function from SQS. You've realized there's a problem in your business logic. You've done all of that without putting this anywhere near AWS, anywhere near the cloud. Now I've always been quite, I've always felt particularly with serverless applications where you're so tied into things like IAM, things like service integrations that emulating things locally may not always be a good idea. And it isn't, it isn't going to test permissions issues. It isn't going to test misconfigured event sources. It isn't going to test misconfigured integrations, but having this ability to run things locally and catch these first issues in your business logic is really, really valuable to be able to step through the code 
as it is going to run when it's running in AWS is incredibly valuable. That doesn't mean you shouldn't test in the cloud. Now, at the start of this video, I briefly mentioned the local stack. And although what you've learned today will allow you to test the invoke of your Lambda functions, what if those functions need to make a call to a downstream service? Or what about the product API we built in the last video? When a product gets created, maybe you want to actually send an event so that other systems know that products have been created. How would you actually manage making them calls to a downstream service when you're running things locally on your machine? That's one for the next video. I'll see y'all there.